Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Um, so four months ago, I came up with an idea. I've got a habit of doing that. <clears throat> I decided I was going to launch a podcast that was going to inspire people to be better leaders by collecting real warts and all stories from other leaders. Six weeks ago, I launched the first episode and it's been the most extraordinary, validating, energizing journey so far. And I've learned so much. So what I've decided to do is to download my key takeaways from the first six episodes. And I'll do the same after the second lot of six episodes to collate the learnings in my own mind as much as anything else. However, if there are takeaways that I haven't covered in this little video, please add them in the comments down here because I really, really want to hear from you what's resonated with you. So a few people have asked me, why on earth have you taken on yet another thing? Are you not busy enough? Well, you probably know that I've spent most of my career supporting big organizations through digital transformation. Now we're talking about pharmaceutical companies and technology companies and big financial institutions and government organizations and even the UN, which has given me a fairly unique perspective on what's going on. And unlike many academics, I've learned through getting my hands dirty by doing, uh, which has not been always painless, I can tell you now. Um, but what I find is that every single one of those sectors, every one of those organizations, they believe that they're unique. They believe they need sector specific experts, but they really don't. The challenges that they're facing and the way to succeed is the same inside every single one of the organizations that I've worked for and with. So here's the thing, we're all pretty damn sure about what good looks like, you know, the agility and the resilience and the innovation and the customer centricity. We just all keep regurgitating the means. But converting knowledge, strategy, ambition into action is a very different thing and it's not easy. But what I've begun to see over my 20 plus years is that there are repeating patterns and then in the midst of that journey i meet up with dan Ariely, who will join me as one of my guests later on in the series um, he is responsible for my obsession with behavioral psychology which has helped me to understand those patterns better I should probably mention at this point as well that the first time I ever really touched and became intrigued with behavioral psychology is through a friend of mine called Mark Ells, who I still have the honor to work with. So I should also mention at this point, actually, that um, it's in the desert, in the arid, super hot desert with Dan, that I suddenly realize um, that the only way you can get knowledge to stick is by telling stories and through experiences. Anyway, let me get back to what we're talking about. Um, I started wondering, uh, is there a, uh, if I was a mechanistic thinker, I would at this point talk about blueprint for success, but I'm not, so I won't. Um, I guess we would call what I've come up with a framework, let's say. It's my first attempt to codify what has to be in place in the way that a company operates to get to good. The conditions that need to be in place uh, so that we can get agile and customer centric and innovative and all of those things we just talked about. I guess it's like a set of questions we can ask ourselves so that we can benchmark against the best, the C. Does our operating model incentivize or even allow connection, collaboration, communication? Do we really, really reward and recognize people for their time, for their effort, for their energy, for their good thinking, for behaving in constructive ways? 
I'm not going to go through every single one of the, the letters because you, you can see where I'm going, right? These are the conditions in which humans thrive so that companies can thrive. So here's the second thing. So I talk to a lot of senior leaders in big organizations about the need to shift to here if you want to be really successful in the 21st century. And their response is usually, oh, yeah, 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 all of that works, but it could never, never work in a big company like mine. <clears throat> anyway, so as Stephen said in his episode, you absolutely can teach an old dog new tricks. It's not easy, but it is doable, and it takes a bit of courage. Now, let's, let's be honest, there isn't one company in the world that's getting it all absolutely right, but some amazing leaders have made some extraordinary things happen by harnessing the power of these, and I'm lucky enough to have worked with some of them. So I thought to myself, what would happen if we start to collect stories, real stories of how people have proved that these ways, not the old ways, work and start collecting the impact that's been generated in these corporate complex settings. Why? So that we can point those leaders to these stories and make them believe that it's possible so that more and more leaders move towards nurturing environments in which humans can thrive so that companies can thrive. Whew. Okay, sorry about that. It took a little longer than I expected. <clears throat> so anyway, I send this, the Create Framework, to my guests and ask them to tell three stories triggered by these words. Um, all of the stories have been absolutely brilliant, but and so validating actually. Um, but I'm just going to recap a few little nuggets of what I've learned. Uh, the first episode was with Lord Jim Knight, who is, by the way, one of my favorite humans in the world. And he's done all sorts of things, theater and sales and politics. He was actually a member of parliament in one of the governments in the UK and business. But the way that he's approached each of these things has been the same business, politics, sales, it doesn't matter. He said it's all about listening, and building trust. He also suggested that I'm missing word, and that word is community. By creating a community, listening to that community, bringing members of that community into decision-making processes, it keeps you honest, he said. He explained the power of, 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 of connecting and empowering that community. And he told the story of what happens when you stop listening to that community when you just go ahead and make decisions for them and the story does not have a happy ending. Carol Lazel was episode two. She is a senior director at Salesforce. She is a wonderfully warm, authentic woman. It took me about 20 seconds to figure out that she is a 100% bona fide, imagine a leader. So she has mostly worked in old financial institutions. Um, she told one story um, which was about how she managed to lead a team from rock bottom to the very top of the performance league, not by bullying, not by command and control, but by building trust, by being vulnerable, by being authentic, by surrounding herself with critical friends. And by doing so, she's avoided the thing that so many leaders do as they rise the ranks start believing we know best because our own ideas are the best ideas and she tells a brilliant story actually i've just thought about how she empowered that team to get creative and how they use live data to make customers feel really really cared for in a moment of crisis and therefore obviously love the brand more I'm going to actually, I've got written down a quote here, actually, that I really wanted to quote from that particular one. One could argue, she says, that the most junior person is the most important person because they're the people that are talking to your customers. 
So I focus, she says, on impressing down. If I make it a great place to work, they do a good job and that reflects on me. It's common sense, right? But common sense is not so common inside most large organizations. Episode three was Stephen Roberts, who was the chief operating officer of Barclays, and now he's leading culture change. It's interesting how many people are moving from operations to culture. Same thing, guy. Um, so there were brilliant stories. And I suppose one of the things that really, really resonated with me, and it's something that I took away from Jim's as well, is that their leader empowered them to try and test and learn and experiment and see what works. So they, it was very much a story of this kind of continuous wiggly improvement. One story really, really resonated with me from a beat perspective, the power of harnessing the energy of junior colleagues um, and empowering them and trusting them uh, to find and energize other change agents across the organization to create a community of change agents, of rewarding and recognizing their behaviors. Brilliant. So yes, you guys, you can teach an old dog new tricks. So week four was Isabel Naidu. I love that woman. She inspires me. She's an inspiration. And the feedback that I've got from you guys is that her stories have really inspired a lot of other listeners too. So she's a very, very, very senior people leader in a massive global company called FIS Global. You may not have heard of it, but it's 70,000 people massive. Her boss, who is the CHRO, Chief Human Resources Officer, for you that don't know who that means, is called Denise Williams. She is equally extraordinary. They are all about, about how these work and, and the change that they've driven. Her stories were so wonderfully vulnerable and authentic. And what we need to remember is behind every figurehead, every successful, courageous leader, there is still a human filled with doubt and fears and moments where things just don't go so well. We all have them. We just don't hear them often enough. And then we're on to Vince Surf. Vince Surf, what can I say? So what I found out there is that behind the myth, behind the father of the internet, there is the most wonderful, warm, funny human being who has learned a lot about how to get the best from people. So he ran the multi-organizational team, some of the smartest people in the world that built the internet, and then the interplanetary internet for DARPA and Stanford and UCLA. 15 years he ran that. If you can keep people volunteering with you for decades to reach that shared vision. I came away from that conversation just thinking, imagine if every corporation, every public organization, at uh, it could be in the same way as the internet, where everything's got a clear vision that everyone at all levels 100% understand, an architecture that allows every single stakeholder to innovate, to get closer to that goal, and a situation where everyone feels like they have built one of the bricks that led to the building of the cathedral, that they own the success as much as anyone else. And last but not least, back to that arid, scorching desert with Dan, to the moment that made me decide to dedicate my life to helping leaders create the environments where humans thrive. My dear friend and the founder of Burning Man, or one of the founders of Burning Man, Harley Dubois, again, what really touched me about these stories was her honesty, her willingness to admit to her own mistakes and the knowledge that every single mistake is only a stepping stone to being an even better leader. Now, you may not know this. I did not know this before I spent that precious 20 minutes with her, but Burning Man is manned by, wait for it, 13,000 volunteers, 13,000 volunteers. 
if you can keep 13,000 people working together towards a shared aim, now that's what I call leadership. The way that the leadership of Burning Man, Marianne, and a, a, an amazing collection of people, the way that they run the organization is absolutely fascinating. There are so many takeaways for you. Whether you're in a startup or a public organization or a corporate, it doesn't matter. There are so many takeaways that you could learn from, not least of all the ritual and the power of ritual. So the takeaways from all of these fantastic episodes is that behind the role, the figurehead, the success is a real human leader. And I'm so honored that these six humans have felt safe to be 100% themselves to help me and you feel safe to do the same. We spend a huge proportion of our lives our one precious lives at work. There is no reason whatsoever we should accept work being a chore. Transforming the way that we work will lead to a situation which is good for everyone, for profit, for people, and actually for the planet. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me on this recap. Please subscribe to the podcast. The links are below. We've got a lot more lined up for you over the next six weeks and i can't wait so please join me for that and please do feel free to dm me to suggest more leaders more imaginal leaders to join our list of guests be inspired be imaginal be more human